Hello, and welcome to this lesson on memory and potential. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to define memory and potential and explain how a memory potential is established and maintained. This topic is important because it is the basis for the action potential, which is in turn the principal mechanism by which the nervous system transmits information. From a practical standpoint, memory and potential is important for the MCAT because it integrates several key science concepts. You may very well see questions that you'd normally expect in chemistry or physics couched in the language of memory potentials. So with that, let's begin. So what is mem memory potential? Well, memory potential is simply the difference in electrical potential between the interior and exterior of a biological cell. You should be familiar with the concept of electrical potential from physics, but in brief, it is the electrical potential energy per unit charge. In biology as in physics, there is an associated electrical potential whenever there is a separation of electrical charge. So if we had a positive and negative charge and we have a separation in space, there's an electrical potential associated between these charges. Now for a membrane potential, we need three things. We need a cell membrane. We need a concentration difference between the inside and the outside of the cell in ions. So there need to be a different concentration of ions inside and outside the cell. And we need selective permeability. That is the idea that the membrane should allow some ions, but not others, to pass across from the inside to the outside. So these are the three components that are required for a membrane potential. So how do we get them? Well, the cell membrane comes with a cell. Now, the concentration difference in ions is created by active transporters. Active transporters are integral membrane proteins that use the energy of ATP to move substances against their concentration gradients, that is, from regions of low concentration to regions of high concentration. The active transporter that you should be most familiar with is the sodium-potassium ATPase, which is responsible for establishing sodium and potassium gradients observed in cells, most importantly, neurons. So that's what we have here, actually. And in normal cells, the concentration of sodium is lower on the inside than it is on the outside, and the sodium-potassium ATPase is responsible for establishing that. It takes sodium from the inside and moves it outside. Conversely, it takes potassium from the outside and moves it to the inside, utilizing the energy of ATP. Now, selective permeability comes from ion channels, which are a class of membrane-spanning proteins that form conduits between the interior and exterior of the cell, allowing ions to move freely. So ion channels are selective, and they only allow certain ions to pass. So if we had, for example, sodium, and we have potassium, and let's say chloride, if this is a sodium selective channel, only the sodium can pass through. If potassium were to try, if chloride were to try, they'd be blocked. So this is just for sodium. Importantly, ion channels differ from active transporters in that they don't require the input of energy in the form of ATP. This is a passive process. Ions will flow down their concentration gradients uh, in toward equilibrium, but this is not an energy requiring process. So together, these three things, a membrane, active transporters, and ion channels, enable the creation of a membrane potential. So let's now consider how this process actually proceeds. To simplify our analysis, rather than looking at a real cell, we're going to look at a two compartment model. We can see the three required pieces. We have the membrane here. We have an ion channel, right, that allows for the passage of potassium. And we have a difference in concentration of ions between the compartments. In compartment one, we have 10 millimolar potassium chloride. And in compartment two, we have one millimolar potassium chloride. If you look at the top, you can also see a voltmeter. Compartment two, uh, is the set as the reference, and so what's being measured here is the electrical potential of compartment one relative to compartment two. So with these initial conditions, there is no memory potential because there's not yet any separation of charge, and so the memory potential is equal to zero millivolts. Now, to understand what's going to happen next, you need to think about the two forces at play, the chemical driving force and the electrical driving force. The, chem the chemical driving force is, comes from the difference in concentration between the compartments. Solutes want to spread out and diffuse to areas where there's less solute, or they want to move down their concentration gradients. No matter how you say it, it's the same idea. So, 
The electrical driving force, on the other hand, is from the familiar idea that likes repel and opposites attract. You put a bunch of positive charges together in a small space and they want to move away from each other. Well, that same idea is going to show up in our analysis of the two compartment model. So, with this understanding, let's set this experiment in motion. In the beginning, we're going to have all chemical driving force. There's a 10 time difference in concentration between compartment one and compartment two. So we're going to have K ions, potassium ions, moving from one to two. That's the driving force. Potassium is gonna to move to compartment two through the ion channel. Now note, the chloride anions are gonna stay behind. They can't move through these channels, only potassium. So we're going to get potassium moving from compartment one to compartment two. Now this will happen for a time, but as the potassium ions are moving, an electrical begin potential begins to form. Now why is that? Well, because there's an imbalance between the positive and negative charges. The potassium ions are moving into compartment two, but they're leaving behind the chloride ions in compartment one. So we're getting net positive charge in compartment two and net negative charge in compartment one. Now, as this emerging electrical potential continues to grow, consider what's going to happen to the flow of potassium from compartment one to compartment two. Remember our principle before about electrical driving force, that likes repel likes and opposites attract. Therefore, this buildup of positive charge in compartment two is going to oppose the influx of the positively charged ion potassium from compartment one to compartment two. So in addition to the chemical driving force, which is going from left to right, we now have the electrical potential opposing that flow pushing back and actually sending some of the potassium back to the ion channel to compartment one. Now as more charge builds up, the electrical potential continues to increase until the point where the electrical potential exactly opposes the chemical driving force. So here, the chemical driving force is equal but opposite in direction to the electrical driving force. At this point, there's no further net movement, no net movement of ions across the membrane. And we have reached a point called the electrochemical equilibrium, which makes sense because the electrical and chemical driving forces are equal. If you look at the voltmeter also, you'll notice that the arrow has moved. It now reads negative 58 millivolts. That value comes from an equation you should be familiar with from electrochemistry, the Nernst equation. Now, we won't go into that here, but you should know that the Nernst equation is what we use to calculate the equilibrium potential of a single ionic species, whether it's in a test tube or a hypothetical cell like we have here. Each ion can have its own equilibrium potential. We've looked at the potassium equilibrium potential under these particular conditions, but if we were looking at sodium or chloride or calcium, each would have its own equilibrium potential. But what about real cells? Aren't there multiple ions involved? How do we figure out the membrane potential there? Real cells are a little more complicated. The main difference is that a cell is permeable to more than one ion by virtue of having several different ion channels. So the sodium, potassium, and chloride in this case. But still, amazingly, the process of setting up a membrane potential in a cell is the same as we saw in the two compartment model. You can use your knowledge of the two compartment model to conceptualize membrane potential in real cells. For the purpose of the MCAT, you should know the following about real cells. The concentration of sodium is much higher on the outside than on the inside of the cell. Conversely, the, uh, the concentration of potassium is much higher inside the cell than outside the cell. And these concentration gradients are established by the sodium-potassium ATPase. Now, in excitable cells such as neurons, at rest, the membrane is largely permeable to potassium, but not sodium or other ions. So even though other ion channels are in the membrane, they're closed and most ions can't pass, but potassium can, even at rest. And for that reason, the membrane potential of a neuron approximates the equilibrium potential of potassium, which is about negative 70 millivolts. This value, negative 70 millivolts, is important, and it's called the resting membrane potential. For the MCAT, you should remember this number, and you should also remember that the cell interior is negatively charged relative to the exterior. With this knowledge, we're now ready to discuss action potentials in the next lesson.